Good morning, everyone, and good evening. Uh, my name is Naomi Sunderland. I'm from the Creative um, Arts Research Institute at Griffith University in Australia. It is my great uh, pleasure to welcome you all here tonight for our second webinar as part of the Play On series, which is being co-hosted by the um, the Creative Arts Research Institute at Griffith University and the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance. We're all extremely excited to be seeing you all again. Um, and for all the newcomers as well, a very, very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us tonight. And a special gold um, star and badge for our colleagues from the US who are joining us extremely early in the morning. You're very welcome and thank you for joining us here tonight for the discussions. So we are going to move on quite quickly tonight in terms of getting into the, the joyous offerings of music, of poetry, of storytelling um, and song to, to bring us together around this shared topic of caring for self and others in complex and creative research for change. A, a key theme across all of the webinars in the Play On series is change. Um, and all the topics that we've been that we're going to be discussing throughout the year were really germinated in the first event, the Getting to Know You event we had on World Human Rights Day last year in December. So hopefully the people in that initial event see themselves represented in these topics and, and all the newcomers um, can bring their own unique takes on these topics as well. So we'll move now into the next slide. Thanks, Shane. So we've got great support here from University of Limerick. Shane, thank you so much for being here with us alongside all of the co-conveners of the, um, the webinar series. We've been doing an acknowledgement of country at all of the webinars and it's, it's a process that we're, we're sharing across the different countries and continents that we're joining from. For those of you in Australia, you're probably really uh, familiar. This, this is... Um, a traditional First Nations cultural protocol of acknowledging the traditional owners, custodians and caretakers for the land of, of sentient country that we live, learn, love um, from and that we're joining from today. So I would like to acknowledge the Gubbi Gubbi or Kabi Kabi peoples at the Sunshine Coast in Australia and also my own ancestors, the Wiradjuri First Nations people. But in doing this, I, I acknowledge also the diverse country that we are all joining from, from across different continents around the world. We acknowledge their ancestors, your ancestors, um, the elders, past, present and emerging. Now, acknowledgement of country is slightly different to what um, other people might, you might have heard people refer to as a welcome to country. Welcome to country is also a traditional cultural practice. Um, but only custo traditional custodians and caretakers for that particular country can offer a welcome. And so when we're doing acknowledgement, um, we, are, we are acknowledging their role, their custodianship and that enduring care and knowledge and intimacy and codependency um, with that particular country that we're joining from. So if people would like to, I invite you to do your own acknowledgement of the country that you are joining from. And you may even want to share as part of your acknowledgement some of your own um, ancestors, some of your the, the rich cultural ancestry that you bring into the engagements and the co-learning, the sharing and developing that we're planning on for tonight. I've been asked to do something really special as part of our event tonight. And the request came from a dear colleague and friend of mine, Antonia Burke, who's a Tiwi woman from the north of Australia. She's an incredible healer. Um, she's a facilitator of healing uh, for trauma in particular, um, in First Nations communities and particularly working with women. But she's been also a very, um, successful activist and, and dedicated activist for the health of the Tiwi Seas. So the seas over the top of Australia and the saltwater country. And Antonia said to me when I talked to her last week, Naomi, next time you sing, next time you're playing music, can you sing for the Tiwi Sea? And when we talk about singing for country, there's a phrase that we often use is singing up country. 
And so when we meet, um, when I, I've met with Antonio and others, you know, the first thing I would do in the morning is sit flat on country and sing and play my guitar and put that energy into country for the health of country. And there's different stories. There's different songs that we sing to navigate through country. There's different songs we sing for the health of country in particular species. Um, and, you know, and there's stories that when we sing the songs of particular species, even though they're endangered, they may um, become more visible and their well-being improves by that, you know, that symbiosis, that interdependent relationship between humans not being separate from country. So when we sing up country, we sing for its health. And even though we, even people who may not subscribe um, to that worldview or that way of seeing and the power of music, singing up country and having that intimacy with country delivers a specific way of being with the earth um, that involves custodianship, care, mutuality, and all the things we are in dire need of uh, across the world today. So when we move to our opening performance, um, which I'll introduce in just a moment with um, Professor Vanessa Tomlinson, we want to give you an open invitation to, with your mics left off, so turned off, um, hum, resonate, make any sounds that you would like to that come to you to sing up country where you are. And if it feels right to you to send that energy that healing to the TWCs as Antonia has requested of us. And I told her that I would be asking you all to do it and she was ecstatic. So that's a gift that we can give. So starting to move now, um, Shane, over to Vanessa. So I'll give you a quick introduction to Vanessa. We're really lucky to have Vanessa with us tonight as our opening performer. As a percussionist, musician and artist, Vanessa celebrates embodied knowledge alongside traditional research demonstrating song, strong support in mentoring and rethinking research training approaches. She has uh, a deep and ongoing engagement with art science collaborations, intercultural relationships and exploring the politics of listening. She is currently professor in music at Griffith University and also happens to be our director at CARI, the Creative Arts Research Institute. So we're in for a treat. Thank you and over to you, Vanessa. Good morning and good evening. Listening, improvisation, sound and place are four, four words that are central to me. Listening is a choice. When we listen, we are attentive and the action of listening can open up space, unfurl inhibitions and provide entry into hidden worlds. Improvisation is not just doing anything, it's doing something. For me, it's presenting my unique sonic signature, like my fingerprint. And I happen to like sounding like me. Sound is vibration. We can hear sound, but we also feel sound. It's multisensorial. Remember the last time the hairs on your skin were activated by sound? And place is never neutral. It is always information. It consists of things, people, memories, resonances, contexts, communities, trees, air, insects. We are always ecological. So I'm gonna play my tam-tam for you, here behind me, in the basement of my Queenslander, which is really a giant resonating wooden box. You might not be able to hear all of the nuance through the wires that connect us, from the slow vibrations that I'm gonna be feeling through the floorboards and through my belly, to the shimmering frequencies that dance somewhere above what I can actually hear. But inside this particular instrument for me is a universe of sound. Happy humming and happy listening.
Absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely Thank gorgeous. Thank you. I can feel that resonance coming through here to me and I hope it came through to all of you wherever you're sitting. Absolutely gorgeous. Thank you, Vanessa. And we have another treat tonight, everyone. Uh, Shane, if we can move forward. We've got Dr. Bill Platts with us. It's another feature of these webinars we're hoping to continue with is to have artists, visual artists involved with musicians, multimodal presentations, ways of responding, ways of doing research. Um, Bill Platts is an American-Australian artist, teacher and researcher with a disciplinary focus on drawing, who exhibits and publishes regularly in the US, Europe and Australia. With research concentrations in life drawing, portraiture and pedagogies of drawing, Bill's recent work, Confets Drawing, The Body and Puppets. Dr Platts is currently Head of Drawing at the Queensland College of Art here at Griffith University and I'd love to invite you Bill just to share a bit of what you're going to be doing during our webinar here together tonight. All right, thank you so much. Can you hear me? They're all right? Yes, great, loud yeah, and clear. Right. All right, thanks so much. I know it's a little dark in here. I've got the uh, the light on behind me. I'll, I'm I'm really um, so excited to have been invited here tonight. Thank you so much um, for having me and uh, in involving me in this uh, in this project. I'm I'm just delighted. And what I'm going to be doing tonight is really just responding, listening, and responding to what y'all are up to for the next hour. And I have set up behind me on the wall a large sheet of paper. Now I've got charcoal and erasers, basic materials. But I've also got a camera set up um, that's on an interval that's going to be taking a photograph every 15 seconds. Um, so over the course, I'll get four of drawings a minute over the course of the 70 minutes or so. So I should get close to 300 drawings by the end of this evening. And then that camera is feeding each one of those drawings back into a sequencer. So it will create a motion drawing, an animation um, of that, that will uh, hopefully, you know, if I run it on twos at about 12 frames a second, will give us about 30 seconds of, uh, of drawing at the end. And uh, this is part of a, a really exciting tradition um, where artists, um, even going back to the early 20th century, were experimenting with film and trying to figure out ways to bring drawing and music together and movement through film. And uh, it's a method I use quite a lot in my own work. And uh, I'm, I'm just delighted. So I, as Vanessa was just playing, I started the drawing. I think I've got about um, 30, I've got 20 or 30 frames already. And when I'm done chatting, I'll stand back up and I'll just keep drawing and I'll draw through the entire evening. And then when it's all done, hopefully uh, we'll have something for everyone to look at. All right. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Bill. So exciting. And thanks for putting um, your creativity and instincts to play in coming up with that concept for tonight. Absolutely great. I think when we, we first approached Billy said, and all this in 75 minutes, and we said, yeah, he was up for it. So can't wait to see, Bill, it's absolutely great. So now we get to move on to um, something that's been a feature of our engagement so far in this beautiful um, and growing collaboration between our two institutions and the different countries and nations involved. And we really love to think of it as weaving, you know, and we very deliberately use that metaphor and that process in the way that we've, you know, we're hosting the, the webinars, passing the baton backwards and forwards between the countries, but also in, you know, we have two speakers tonight from University of Limerick and two from Griffith University, and, and we weave in and around topics from these different perspectives. Um, tonight we've got Rowan Hardy, Diane Daly, Hala Jabba and myself as the offerings or the offerers of short stories. These are really vignettes. These are five minutes maximum around this topic of caring for self and others in, in creative and community engaged research for change. I'll just tell you a little bit about our beautiful weavers for tonight. Rowan is head of department for the arts at Coolum State High. And, and Queensland representative for the Australian Performing Rights Association, Songmakers National Advisory Team. Rowan's doing a PhD at Griffith at the moment and he's investigating playful pedagogies in the secondary music classroom, through which he aims to develop professional practice in effective and equitable ways. Thanks Ro for being with us. Diane Daly from University of Limerick, 
is a violinist, educator and researcher. As a performer, Diane made her debut in Ireland as a soloist with RTE Symphony Orchestra at the age of 12 and has played principal with all the Irish orchestras and toured internationally. She's also performed and recorded alongside many of our favourite names in rock and leads her own jazz trio, which is something her and Roe actually have in common as well as their interest in education. Diane is a qualified Dalcroze researcher and teacher and for many years ran a parallel career as an educator incorporating Dalcro's approaches into instrumental teaching. And if you don't know what that is, we're going to find out more when Diane offers her five minute submission for us. Hala is a Palestinian community music musician who's currently working on an Irish Research Council postdoctoral fellowship. And some of you might remember Hala was one of the opening um, speakers at our December event. Hala's research investigates co-designing, piloting and evaluating a training program using arts-based methods for individuals working in the context of post-conflict. And she obtained her PhD in arts, practice in music at the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance. Um, after we've done these offerings and we're going to finish um, tonight with a beautiful musical offering from Kathleen Turner, but I'll, I'll come back and, and say a little bit more about Kathleen. And I am the fourth speaker. The, the weaver, the, the final weaver from Griffith University. So with that, I am just really ecstatic to hand over to you, Ro, to kick us off for tonight. Thanks, Naomi. Um, and also thanks to Kathleen um, for having me. I'm extremely humbled to be um, speaking alongside some incredible people this evening. Um, I'm also um, humbled to be um, online to speak to people about what, I'm, what my story is basically and to share it with a bunch of um, people from all across the world um, from America and of course from um, Ireland and Australia um, and to which I'd like to also finish by acknowledging the Cubby Cubby people also the people who are the custodians of the land here on the beautiful Sunshine Coast where I live. Um, so my offering today has a title and it's called Do We Need a Key? When I think of challenging systems, I ruminate thoughts of oppression, conformity, uniformity, and efficiency. Many of the experiences that have come to shape my understanding of self care and personal well being as a secondary school teacher in Australia. Though, as I've begun to understand and learn in my subsequent years of research and an emerging from a pandemic, oppression, conformity, uniformity, and efficiency have come to represent opportunities for surrender, vulnerability, deconstruction, and joy, that by their very nature embody self-care and growth. In this image, I see through the padlock and chain, a light that provides an openness to possibility and a transcendence that's wholly unique and implicit to our own personal potential. I will talk to the themes of surrender, vulnerability, deconstruction, and joy through my experience as a musician and as a music educator, realized through my formative musical training and my career in education. As I've come to discover, have reframed my narrative and personal disposition to self-care. Two years ago, at the spark of the pandemic and as the world began to shut down, an opportunity arose for pause, to be at peace and to hold space, an awareness of the breathing out and the surrender to the unknown. A potential for release, as Michel Foucault described as a way of introducing a break into the domain of life taken over by power. In Australia, we experience weeks and months of isolation in education as we learn new approaches to teaching remotely, whilst hibernating within our own blanket of self-care as incoming policies of well-being were drafted and distributed around us. This imposed retreat from the normative state of being initially allowed for me to return to my comfortable musical solace as an improvisational surrender to the possibilities and search for new meanings. I was gifted the opportunity to pause and consider, as Lee Patel described, a step away from colonial projects that shape the technology, knowledge and connection through the veritable non-stop stimulation of emails, updates, events and deadlines, all competing for my attention. 
I felt the productive interruption of the competitive ways of being, doing and knowing and felt the potential for learning within them. I anticipated a bloom of something exciting and opportunistic for our way of being. Yet, as the weeks turned to months and as teachers and students returned to classrooms, the politics of our education systems and our conditioned habitus within them were determined to return to a state of control, structure and efficiency. From this pause, surrender and our nourishing breathing out, we've inhaled in our return to life as it was and have been left gasping for air ever since. As we've breathed in and returned to teaching, we've rapidly deconstructed our practice, adapted new patterns of behavior and conditioned ourselves at times to a sense of meaninglessness. Facing great challenges in professional practice, we have attempted to make sense of music education from online to socially distance face-to-face -face tuition and back again, and have navigated dystopian classrooms of masked, de-identified and scared children and consoled anxious parents and community members, we have been left vulnerable. And as the systems around us have grappled with new ways of legitimizing the unknown. This surrendering has peeled back layers of security and confidence in musical and pedagogical practice. And for many in the teaching profession, for myself and for many of my colleagues, we've struggled to find comfort and flow. And we've continually search through trauma that has very recently appeared through increasing cases of anxiety. And it's left me finding ways of coping and supporting those around me, questioning how this pause in our doing tore open our temperament for vulnerability and self-reflection. I have been pondering my musical willingness in remaining open to such vulnerability, whether it be an improvisation or my yearning to take on something new and it's jarring disfigurement to the systems of power around me. As though I possess a key that I cannot, un that cannot open the padlock I see before me. Rather, I'm in need of a different tool or a different approach perhaps to cut the chain that binds me and to reach through to the light ahead. Critically, I need strategies that help for me to feel an awareness or a consciousness of trauma and of healing release Contending with the perceived return to normality we're experiencing in education has left scattered shards of ourselves strewn between our personal and professional lives. Despite every opportunity we've had to rebuild, to not fight and to let go to the slow process of reconstruction, we fended off renewed efficiencies and rigid systems, or as Stephen Ball described, the terrors of performativity and the battle for teachers' souls. But there is hope. Just as the pandemic has provided us the opportunity for pause, it's provided us with an opportunity for deep reflection and for gratitude. The devastating toll on those affected by the virus and for those of us recovering physically and mentally through the pandemic has presented a great challenge for humanity. In practicing gratitude, I've been reminded of the joyful liberation music making has brought me in my life and I've begun to envision teaching and my life in education in the same way. I am in search of new ways to play within and on the periphery of the systems around me, to stop and to pause and to press play in the same way I did when the pandemic first began. Finally, I now see that a key is not important. Rather, it is a process in manipulating the links in the chain to see through to the light. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Rowan. That was gorgeous. Thank you. I'd just like to say, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I'd just like to say that um, Vanessa's playing um, was just um, incredibly powerful. And uh, thank you. Um, I, I could feel it all the way to the other side of the world. Um, so my name is Diane Daly, I'm a violinist, and a lot of people um, would describe their research experiences, their PhDs as, you know, rather stressful times of their lives. But I can honestly say that my PhD actually 
taught me self-care and uh, I know they don't often go together um, those things but for me as a violinist a classically trained violinist um, self-care didn't really make much of an appearance in my training or my practicing as a small child or in all the competitions and um, this endless pursuit for perfection that uh, was very inherent in my training. I'm also a Dalcro's Eurythmics educator and uh, Dalcro's Eurythmics is kind of an embodied method of music education. It's about learning through movement and by movement. It involves the whole body and it integrates all our faculties. So emotional, physical, cerebral, spiritual, um, all the things we're talking about today. And um, and although I was a professional violinist for, or well, have been and still am for over twenty years, I very much kept that te that side of myself. I suppose I reserved it for the teaching studio, particularly with small kids. And my training as a violinist was was very much not about learning through the whole body. It was very much about focusing on virtuosity, about being perfect. Everything happened to be perfect and technical excellence. As I say, self-care didn't wasn't really, you know, it wasn't a term I was even familiar with. And unfortunately, this kind of narrow focus in our conservatoires, it leads to a culture which is riddled with musicians who are in physical pain, discomfort and performance anxiety. You know, if you go, I'm, I'm sure maybe some of you have been to an orchestra, you know, or a concert or something and... Um, I can assure you, like, if that was a building site, an orchestra, um, health and safety would have probably banned most orchestras um, by now. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a shame really how, how the culture has become so, so riddled, with, with a lack, riddled with a lack of kind of self-care. So my research was about combining these two aspects of my life, my, my performing self. Um, I'm a member of the Irish Chamber Orchestra, I have been for... 25 years or something um, and and then I had my teaching side which was more about my Dalcro side and so my research was trying to find a way to put these together and um, the wonderful Helen Phelan who is here today um, she supported my research she was my supervisor um, and really uh, modeled for me how how research could become for me a form of self-care and how musical performance could be transformed. Um, so Dalcroze, if you um, see the quote here, he talked about um, how we could use music to turn technique into a way of externalizing and fulfilling ourselves. And that was not something that my training kind of emphasized. Um, he also said you know, to, about turning the music, to use the music so that its experience through the body can become a deeply personal and liberating experience. Um, my experience was more like the picture of the sheep. Um, it was more about doing exactly what my teacher said and doing exactly the way I do it, even though maybe your fingers are a totally different shape than mine that didn't seem to be considered or that I'm a very different person than my teacher. My interpretation was not allowed to be uh, mine. It was very much, you must do it this way because this is how everybody else does it. So there's this cloning kind of thing that goes on in conservatories, which is very sad. And I'd, so I discovered that creativity, autonomy, uh, were kind of crucial for meaningful music making. And I started, I suppose, to ask the right questions for the first time, instead of waiting for instruction or external validation, which often happens in the classical music culture because it's so much about competition. And um, I learned how to use my body to guide my musical decisions. So my Dalcro's training helped me to, to realize that you know my bodies don't lie, and so started to trust in my body. And I discovered this idea that the artist was inside of me. In fact, the title of my research was "Unearthing the Artist." As part of one of my performances, um, the picture over in the left-hand corner that was me as a little girl. Um, I represented Ireland in a in a European Broadcasting Union uh, performance in. I think I was 12 and um, it brought back a lot of memories when I was going through these old photographs and remembering, remembering I suppose the, 
the trauma of being sent to my room for like five, six hours every day to practice and ha- not having any idea how to practice in a kind of a meaningful way. And um, so I kind of created this multidisciplinary autoethnographic theatre show piece where I explored through movement and improvisation and composition um, this whole area of kind of trying to find my own voice and my own creativity. And I suppose I realised that I I had never acknowledged that my body was my primary instrument and therefore I felt quite disconnected. Um, so exploring embodiment in my musical life, actually with my whole body, with the space that I'm in, uh, the instrument, the music, the audience, all this kind of connection, it kind of began to transform how I communicated. It also transformed how I teach. I teach on the MA uh, in classical string performance here in UL. And because I'm the course director of the program, I'm able to kind of weave this whole approach into my teaching, which I'm very, very fortunate to do. It's also transformed how I perform on the stage and also how I parent um, my own young musical children myself. Um, as was the greatest discovery was for me that I experienced joy when I performed in this way and when I rehearsed in this way. And, you know, I'd often talk with my students about, I don't know if you have this phrase, uh, we talk about, you know, throwing the baby out with the bath water. Um, if you've never heard that expression before, um, you let me know in the chat. But it's, it's about this idea that maybe for me, the baby would be possibly like the music and the joy of making music. But often we spend so long, so many hours and hours and weeks and years uh, trying to find perfection and trying to find the perfect sound and trying to find the perfect bow hold and the, that often we end up throwing out the music itself with the bad water. And I've found that in my teaching all along and working with other young people that there's so much focus on, on being like this sheep cloned to play like their teacher or on being a, a good student instead of actually being a creative artist or or too much focus on playing perfectly and winning competitions, that the, the reason that has brought us to music in the first place with this pure joy is just gone. It's gone out with all the cleaning. So this joy for me and this discovery of how to self-care actually is what joy has brought for me. Um, that has become my self-care because when I'm, when I'm being like that as an artist, then I really feel I'm taking care of myself. And I'm very fortunate because I, because I'm a teacher as well, that I can actually transform other lives as well in the, in, with the students I work with. And, and so I'm very fortunate to have that. So, and I'm gonna pass you on to Hala next, uh, who's also here at the Irish World Academy with me. So thank you again. And it's been an honor to chat to you tonight. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you, Diane and Rowan. These are really great presentations. Um, so it's that moment uh, where you no longer feel able to really listen, to really understand what your participants want, what they need. It's that moment when you, your facilitation of a workshop becomes a very heavy chore rather than an enjoyable time. And it's that moment when we feel we no longer have anything to give. It's normally that moment when we step back and ask why. But my question, why do we wait until that moment to take action to care for ourselves? I recently finished um, conducting interviews for my research. And even though I have not completed my data analysis, I can notice two very if I say warning signs coming through. One, there's a, a lot of lack of support to individuals working in post-conflict situations from their organization. And two, and maybe, just maybe, there's a lack of motivation from us community musicians to care for ourselves. I have to admit that I once was told that, oh, Ala, you seem to be really good at caring for yourself. And I understood that to be an accusation and I felt really, really ashamed because I felt that it was implied that I'm not doing my job well because I do take a moments for myself. 
Um, when Professor Helen presented last time, she used some pictures from Skelly Michael, and I was taken back to the time when I visited the island with some friends. And these are some pictures from this lovely excursions that we had. You, you can see a little bit of the roughness of the island, the stairs we had to take to go up. And what resonates really with me in these pictures is the concept of boundaries and parameters of safety. Because we were warned and actually given a really lengthy lecture on the possible dangers of being on the island, the stairs, they're not equal, they may be slippery, there's no barrier. So in short, we were told the boundaries of safety on the island. So I'm reflecting on that and going back to the community music literature and safety around self-care. And what I'm finding is it all revolves about the community musician pri providing a safe space for the participants. Yeah, I didn't really find, and if you know of any, please let me know, literature to say, but how do I keep this the space safe for me as a facilitator? Through this research, the concept of setting self boundaries and understanding them is coming through very strongly because when working in the context of post-conflict migration, participants sometimes are looking for social connections that they have left behind in their country. With that, boundaries may be pushed, they may become invisible. And so your first step to maintaining some kind of self-care is to set clear boundaries between your relationship with the participants. Because if you don't, there may be very unrealistic expectations from your participants, which could cause stress and emotional fatigue. You can become their translator, you can become their legal advisor, you become their friends, and at time, their therapist. And this point was very, very clearly demonstrated in one of the participants I talked with, where they said, you know, they were phoning her to talk about issues they had, while she was dealing with her own feelings and her own issues of life, which led her to feel very emotionally overwhelmed and actually stepping back from the project. Um, so, you know, going back to the island where even with all the warnings, even with all the safety talk, I felt really safe because I knew the group of friends I had has got my back. I knew if anything would have happened to me on that island, you know, my friends would have gotten my back and I would have gotten their back. So referring back to the community music world, initially it's all about the group holding the safe space for them. However, if you feel overwhelmed or emotional or close to be burning out, it's your own responsibility to take care of that. And I'm asking myself, are we meant to be super facilitators? Um, so this leads me to this idea, and it's still a very small idea, trust. You know, if, I'm, if my participants are trusting me with their physical and emotional safety, shouldn't I be giving trust back to them for them to hold the space safe for me? Isn't trust reciprocal? And I'm not suggesting by any means that you dump all your emotional baggage on them. No, that's not what I'm saying. But but um, the questions I'm going to leave you today with is, is how do we build boundaries that are based on mutual understanding and trust between ourselves and the participants? And what does this trust, reciprocal trust look like to create a more safe space for the facilitator and for the participants? And with that, I will say thank you. And I'm going to move on and pass it on to Naomi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla, and to all the speakers tonight. Wow, what a lineup. Um, so now, just to reground us, I invite us to breathe, to feel our feet flat on the ground, to be aware of country. Just sorry, previous slide there, Shane. We're breathing a lot tonight. Thank you, thank you. To feel our feet flat on the ground, to be aware of country supporting us, that is part of us, to listen to the sacred sounds around us and in us, connecting with the deep sense of wholeness that is always here, 
noticing where that sits in our bodies as a resource. In doing this, we are regulating our nervous systems and we are co-regulating as a community. I appreciate the way you are all holding the space for our stories and songs tonight without judgment or direction. And I know how to tell my stories even when I don't. And I will listen to yours if you would like to tell them. I take my professional, cultural, political and personal responsibilities as a music facilitator and researcher seriously. When we meet for trauma-aware collaboration, ideally we will invite discussion about aspirations, benefit, values, safety, protocols, and how to respond respectfully when the chips are down. When we don't do this and something challenging or unforeseen happens, we are all less protected. My cultural big brother, Glenn Woods, says that our defaults always come out when we're under the pressure. What are my defaults and what are yours? Let's keep breathing. These are important things to know. Why do I take these things so seriously? My research crosses the beautiful, tender and bumpy terrain of trauma every single day. I need to work in certain ways to survive and thrive and be part of my team, my own family and my communities. The topics that we touch on and are affected by are littered with colonial genocide, forced removal, racism, structural and invisible violence, sexism, misogyny, poverty, rape and more even if those words are never uttered. From a trauma-informed perspective, I do not assume that I can treat this trauma any more than I can rescue others, but I can be, by default, aware that personal and intergenerational collective trauma may be present and affecting me and others in our work. Can I avoid re-traumatising others in all that I do? No, but I will educate myself, try my best and show up. A key part of trauma-aware practice is to invite compassion for myself and others in a caring community as we strive and struggle with all of these things. Aunty Judy and Carly Atkinson say we need to burn our own wood first, like a controlled back burning to avoid catastrophic bushfires in the summer heat and dry. What does that mean and how do I start? Can I even find my own wood to burn? Can we? Aunty Judy says the task is both professional and personal, thinking and knowing with feeling. We need to understand trauma and its inheritance, the theory. She says we need to feel the feelings and never suppress them when they're ready to leap, sting, or sing. Existing research says the arts can co-create spaces for this to all happen safely, but that doesn't mean that art spaces are always safe, are they Hillary, or that they need to be. To burn my own wood, I need to find my family and communities into generational stories of trauma and strength. I need to continue learning and unfolding the ways that they sit in my body and in my communities, the way they shape my fast and involuntary reactions and the way I see myself and others. I need to be patient and hold creative space with others as we all do the same. Research simply equals trauma for some communities. I have seen a single ethics consent form spark a four-day cycle of violent abuse and withdrawal, which ended with me and a co-researcher hiding in a locked room with the curtains drawn. On reflection, all of our reactions to that situation were understandable, given the nature of trauma and the history of place and colonisation. This nation needs healing. This country needs healing. The researcher and research needs healing. My final question to you all 
is what can be the role of trauma-aware, creative and community-engaged research in such healing? And what do we all need to make that happen? Thank you, Shane. And now we move to the next slide. So now in recognition of the richness of the topics just included in that weave, everyone, we just invite you to take 30 seconds to stretch, to breathe in silence. Just to let those questions, the ideas, the feelings, the reactions just settle while we breathe. And if there's a need, if there's something building up, feel free to shake it off, like literally, you know, go the Taylor Swift. Let's just breathe and settle for a moment. Love it, Glenn. <sighs> Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. And Shane, we're ready, I think, to move forward. Okay, so now's the time when we get to break loose, break out, let all that beautiful fertilizer that's been offered from the performers, Bill's work in the background, holding this space for us all, um, the four speakers tonight. What are you feeling now? Um, as we're moving into the breakout space to connect with others. Um, staying, breathing, noticing and sharing. What are you feeling? Who are you with? Listening, listening, listening. What can we all learn? And not just through thinking, but sensing, tuning into others, listening and co-creating. What can we learn? What can we learn from this rich weave and this space together? Thank you all for being here again. Um, so you will be moved now um, by Shane, the, the masterful media man, into some breakout rooms. And it, please engage in discussions together. Breathe, feel, listen, sense, think and co-create. And we'll see you all back here soon. Thank you. I love seeing that, how everyone just comes tumbling out of the rooms back. It's like this rapid population of faces, all smiling, you know, great energy, like lots of energy. So good to see you all. I hope you had some good yarns there. Um, so, um, yeah, like now's our time. We've got a little bit of time to share um, what happened behind closed doors in those breakout rooms. and. Just some prompts, doesn't have to be along these lines, but what did you feel in that collection, in that meeting? Um, who were you with? And what are you taking away? Or what are we taking away perhaps rather than the singular you? And I invite people to add their own responses to that, like really diverse anything at all um, into the chat. But I wonder too if any volunteers from any of the rooms might just want to turn on a mic and share briefly a standout for them. It's also great feedback for us as conveners too to, to sort of know how it's going in there. We might start with, with the conveners. Helen, Kathleen, were you in the same room or different rooms? Alexis. Hi Naomi, I was I was in a room with Glenn, Alexis, and Primanjali, and uh, we 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 took turns having per, our per, sharing our perspectives and those questions and what we were taking, and there are uh, some beautiful questions coming out of it or observations. Um, the 
we talked a lot about listening, about how learning to care for self is also about learning to listen. And even those as musicians or an artist, that's a key part of our work. There's not always the space or the time uh, to do that, as Diane highlighted in, um, in talking about that aspect of her training. Um, there, there were some beautiful phrases like noticing the, the, the potential violence of research and one of the ways to to respond to that is learning to listen better. Uh, we talked a lot about safety and um, the idea of safety as a, as a physical space and our expectations of what that is or what it could be. And Glenn asked, where does that space of safety exist for us as musicians and as researchers? And also, how can I activate that space? Which I thought was a beautiful question. But, the, but in our group also noted, noted that safety does not equate with comfortable. That safety does not mean settling. It does not mean static. It is not a retreat. It is the capacity for us to move forward with confidence and with learning. And uh, we acknowledged that um, it's interesting to talk about safety and, and a sense of relief actually to hear some of the questions asked this morning that have been asked because we've been living in a long period of hyper awareness, of coping, of fear, um, in fact, for an extended period, um, a sense of danger around uh, in many in many aspects, including the pandemic, but the not not exclusively that. Um, and so a sense of relief to hear some of the questions around safety, around acknowledgement of trauma and acknowledgement of, of spaces, of people, of places needing healing. So that was what was coming from our group. Incredible. So Rich, Helen, would you like to share something from a different group? Thanks, thanks, um, Naomi and Kathleen. That's just extraordinary. I'm looking at your questions there and what do you feel? And I have to say, I'm just feeling joy. I'm feeling so much joy, as Diane was saying to us, because I feel I feel safe here. I feel protected. I feel healing from the moment that Vanessa was sharing that 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 extraordinary resonance with us, you know, and that that that's amazing. And 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 who were you with? We actually only had had two in our room, Jane and myself, and and Bill was hovering like an angelic presence in the background. But Jane and I are have been involved in many of these sessions, but we have never yet really got a chance to have a good chat. And that was just gorgeous. So I'm going to hand over to Jane to say a little bit about our about our conversation. Is that OK, Jane? <laughs> OK, that's fine. Yes. Um, yeah, we, we were. Um, yeah, I, I agree that I feel completely connected and a sense of belonging in this company. And um, we talked about how sometimes as a community musician, it, it, you're not often in an environment where everybody's thinking about feelings, about um, looking after oneself. You can't really use that sort of language. Um, and we were we were mostly we were chatting really, but I was talking about something that comes up is the life cycle, the the kind of energy, being aware of body, like Diana was saying. The I was so moved by the idea that um, your body is your first instrument. It's like, I've always felt that, but I've never actually articulated it quite as clearly as that. And in my, I'm now sixty six and have had tons of energy for so much um, activity, music, community music, um, music making with young people and old people alike. And um, I'm having to really listen to my body to look at energy um, and how much energy I have and how I can carry, you know, continue to be purposeful, um, but also, um, uh, Think about yeah just think about it's a, it's a self-care really i'm thinking of and it's a little bit like what hala was saying that setting boundaries for the people you work with setting boundaries perhaps for organizations but also your own boundaries just owning up to what's what feels healthy and what um what you know you can do and still be useful rather than still trying to carry on being the same person 
recognizing and starting to focus on legacy more, uh, focus on things that don't take so much body energy. So we were kind of talking around that and um, the idea of research and study is obviously part of something one can do with all one's life experience. And um, these sessions inspire me to think in that way every time, looking at perhaps doing more research <laughs> and study. That's great. Thanks. Sounds great, Jane. Thank you both. Wow, what a rich like discussion in a short amount of time. And thank you. Great to hear, Jane, about your own reflections there. Amazing. Um, we might have time just for one more contribution from is there is there someone from a different room that wasn't in, in one of those rooms who'd like to share something? Turn on their mic. Uh, I don't mind sharing. Um, yes, thanks, Mary. Yeah, so I actually found myself in the room with Diana and Hala, and I kind of felt, oh gosh, I've got the jackpot here. <laughs> but um, no, but just, I just kind of, after listening to Diana, I'd never met Diana before. I was just totally, from my own work as a choral director, I was totally taken by everything that she said. And um, just that the, the whole thing of, you know, listening to our bodies, that our bodies have the answer. And you know, to be our not being afraid to be ourselves. And I've met Hala before through the through the through the Musicians Without Borders course that we've been doing. And I just it was so lovely to be able to be in the room with both of them that I think I actually hogged most of the time just talking to both the pair of them. Um uh, because I was so I I feel very much elated this morning. How do I feel? I feel very elated. I feel I really needed this morning. Um, I, I'm here on my own. Um, I'm looking after my 95 year old, nearly nearly 95 year old mother, and please God, she will be very soon. And it's just all of ju try, juggling all of the things you do. You know, something I would have said to Hala before would have been that as practitioners, it can be a, quite a lonely uh, experience. You kind of feel sometimes you're very much on your own. So I feel something like this morning has kind of, you know, it's like recharging your batteries in lots of ways. Um, the big thing I, I, I suppose I was saying to Hala and Diane that I find a challenge at the moment is, you know, your pre-pandemic, we kind of, you know, you, you spoke in, you spoke very, very freely in the way, in the way I wanted to speak maybe to the people in front of me. Now I feel that I have to be much more very, very mindful, which I think is a good thing. You know, Rowan talked about that thing of the, 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 the pause, you know, having time to think, having time to reflect. And I think for me, it's that, that time to reflect, you know, I've been able to accept things that I found difficult to accept before. Um, but now that I, as I stand in front of my teenagers, who I do see a huge change in over these last while, that I have to be very mindful of uh, my own language in front of them so that I can bring them along with me in the best possible way that I can. Mm -hmm. So powerful, Mary, and yeah, and just echoing Rowan's sentiment around the pause, just mm -hmm. perfect. And Helen's just put in the chat, isn't it wonderful how the simple act of chatting with each other and listening here gives such support and new ideas. And what really strikes me about every single person who's contributing is they're just speaking from the heart. It's honest. You know, we are connecting. It feels like we are creating a caring community, you know, and, and that, that's incredible. Like hats off to everyone. Um, okay. So any other sentiments, any reflections on how you feel in particular, would love to hear those in the chat from individuals in those groups. So Shane, I think we can move forward and leave people with a little bit of time to put those in the chat, maybe to the next slide. So I'm just wondering, Bill, are you there? Um, did you survive our, our yarning? Um, is your hand okay? And did you wanna quickly just turn on your, your video and, and give us a wave? Hey y'all. Oh, well, yeah, uh, well, I don't see myself there. I think I'm still seeing Shane's screen. Okay, I can see you. I can see you in the studio there. Yeah, we can see you. Oh, you can't. Okay, I can't see myself. Oh, there we go. I can see myself now. There you All right, y'all. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to give you a little, can I give you a little preview now, Naomi, would that work? Yes, please. That'd be awesome. Okay. So. All right, hold on. Let me get back to this. Um, 
All right. So I wound up with 250 drawings. Um, and I've sequenced them at 12 frames per second just as a preview. What I'm going to try to do is hold up the webcam. Um, so hopefully you all can see this. I know it's not ideal, but like I said, I'll still have to render the drawing. Um, I don't know if that's going to come through. Let me turn off the light down. Can you all, you know, I don't know if you can see that at all. Is that focusing? It's not, no. it's very white. No. The, the screen is white, but we can see what's in the background. Oh, that's a shame. Okay, hold on. I'm just going to see if there's a way for you to catch. No, you can't see it. Huh? It's just too, too white. Let's see if I turn up the light in the background, if it'll catch the foreground. Oh, yeah, there we've got it. Now? Yeah, we've got it now. Okay, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Tell me if that's, okay, I'm going to play it. Is everybody ready? We're ready. All right, here, here we go. All right, that was it. Did that come through at all? Goodness, yeah, it did. We got it. I just had such a big lump in my throat. Everyone, like, woo. Uh, it's, still, it's still playing back there. Look, I apologize about just having to um, to flip it on the webcam like that, y'all, but I'll render it now, um, and uh, and and then I'll, I'll share it through to, uh, to the email so that uh, it can get posted for all y'all. Yeah, it's just incredible, oh. Bill. Thank you. We're getting... <laughs> Yes, we're getting fantastic. Wow, incredible, awesome. What? Oh, everything in the chat. Yeah. So, yeah, I think everyone's going to be really, really waiting for that one to come through. Thank you again so much. And I just love seeing you post show in all the glory yeah. with your hands. And yeah, just amazing. Thank well, was, you. So that much. was great. Look, all the stories were incredible and, uh, and the playing. And so it was a wonderful thing to be able to draw to. Thank you so much, y'all, for the opportunity. Thank you, Bill. Okay, and now can I, just to finish, we are going to finish with the wonderful Kathleen Turner. Um, before we invite you to sing Kathleen, I wanted to just check if you wanted to say anything extra about our next webinar, which is in a few months time. We're really working around teaching here, trying to be kind to people. Um, so it's in September, but if people don't know Kathleen, just before I hand over to to you is a singer, songwriter and community musician based at the University of Limerick, where she is course director in the MA Community Music. From 2008 to 14, Kathleen was community engagement manager for the Irish Chamber Orchestra, designing and implementing a number of projects that bring live music into the community. Kathleen is also in her spare time co-chair of the Commission of Community Music Activity for ISMAE, and she's co-chairing this year's conference, which a number of us are uh, registered to attend or presenting at. So over to you, Kathleen, for whatever you would like to say about the next webinar, which you are convening, and then to just bring us to a close with your musical offering. Thank you. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Great. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the next, the, yeah, the the next uh, seminar is going to be on Wednesday, the fourteenth of September, and I'm re I'm really excited about this. We're going to be zooming in on one of the one of the really important topics of our time in terms of protecting protecting environment and and what our roles are in that. And I'm delighted that Kathy Grant, Matthew Klotz, and uh, Kevin McNally will be speaking at that. Um, and we'll also have song uh, on on land on the subject of land and environment from a beautiful traditional singer um, and our director at the Irish World Academy, Dr. Sandra Joyce, will be singing for us to open and close that event. So we really hope that you can all join us and please do spread the word. I'm going to close today with a song from my own research and it's about noticing and um, I, in, the, in this song, there are three different memories, three different images, and I'm going to invite you as I sing to imagine them. The first one is my father, Doogie Turner. He was a big man. And it's the image I have of him coming out of the church doors after a wedding. And he was wearing a three-piece suit 
with a burgundy waistcoat, a gold pocket watch and a Stetson cowboy hat. He was unapologetic in the way he moved through the world and he left with me that sense of moving through the world in an expansive way that I feel when I'm standing in front of a choir. The second image in the song is of Olive, a teacher from a school that I worked with, who, when I was so busy getting ready for my first PhD performance, noticed that I was so busy that I didn't have time to eat. And when I turned up at school the next day to get the kids ready for our, our collaborative performance, she was waiting for me outside the school with a packed lunch that she had made the morning of that day because she wanted to make sure that I was okay. And she taught me to notice the kindness of the community that I was with, to make time to notice that, that I was the recipient of kindness as well as expected to be the facilitator of it too. And the third memory is of a boy in a choir rehearsal. And he was standing at the back of the room in the back row in a corner. So I was the only one who could see him as I stood in front of the choir. And we were singing a piece uh, where we introduced harmony for the first time to the children we were singing with. And as the harmony kicked in, he lifted his face towards the ceiling of the room and he closed his eyes and he kept singing and he let the tears pour down his face. So we have my dad and we have Olive, and we have that boy in the choir room. This is called Living Well. Look at that man's head. Look at how he wears a big hat with pride and a pocket watch dangling by his side. Four teeth missing in his smile Stands out by a country mile Write it down before you let it go Write it down before it gets erased Write it down before it gets replaced By all the things you think you need to do today All the books to read, all the words to say There is a secret There is a secret to living well there is a secret, there is a secret to living well. Look at that woman's hands, look at the food that she made to make sure you eat on a busy day. She took time to mind. A grown woman with a mother far away. Write it down before you let it go. Write it down before it gets erased. Write it down before it gets replaced by all the things you think you need to do today. All the books to read, all the words to say. There is a secret, there is a secret to living well, there is a secret, there is a secret to living well. Look at that boy's face. Look at how he closes his eyes to sing. He lifts his chin and both hands on his chest. There's so much in his wild world to express. Write it down before you let it go. Write it down before it gets erased. Write it down before it gets replaced by all the things you think you need to do today. All the books to read, all the words to say. 
There is a secret. There is a secret to living well. There is a secret. There is a secret to living well. There is a secret. There is a secret to living well. There is a secret. There is a secret to living well. Shanae. Thank you, Kathleen. I think you've sung up something in all of us with that absolutely gorgeous song. And what a melody and what words and sentiments and images to leave us with for tonight. Yes, cry every time. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen, for your beautiful contribution to finish on tonight. Um, I'll leave everyone to just digest that. And please write any final comments in the chat um, as part of a checkout. We'd love to hear how you're going now. Um, any final comments for Kathleen and any of the performers, artists and contributors tonight, please offer your vote of thanks to them as part of our farewell. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. And travel safe, travel well, uh, and we'll see you again soon. <clears throat> thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.